But I tried my first AA meeting as a 19 year old in college. And I went to the meeting and I just pretty much ran out of the meeting as soon as it was over because I was agitated, ready to run because the God language so alienated me. So having been raised Catholic with this very kind of conservative Catholic notion of what a God is, I thought that I'm in serious trouble if my way to get sober is to turn my life and my will over to this God who's got a plan for me who's going to remove my defects of character, who's going to set me on the path and my job is to stay out of the way, that that conception of God never worked for me. Hey, what's going on? Unlatched Mind, episode 57. Uh, My guest today is Peg O'Connor. Peg's a professor of philosophy a recovering alcoholic, and um, among other things, an author. Uh, she she just released a book titled "Higher and Friendly Powers: Transforming Addiction and Suffering." Um, so you know, we we discussed her book, and you know, I think I think you know the main point we really touched on is 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 you know her personal journey of of, of fighting addiction and, and and getting you know and, and and maintaining sobriety. You know, she was really hit with sort of a I'd say a a sort of, sort of a moral conflict with the definition of uh, of a higher you know of of what her higher power was uh, with the definition of a higher power you know which is really the underpinnings of a lot of the AA and and recovery in the twelve step programs um, where she had you know there, there was some there, there was a conflict with her um, personally and, and I'm sure many of the definition of what that higher power is uh, uh, juxtaposed to the traditional Judeo Christian uh, quote unquote higher power um, so. Anyway, it was a really interesting perspective she had on that. She also shared her personal story, which I think was really put context to to her book and to her journey. So, um, so anyway, let's get going. I uh, give you Peg O'Connor. All right. Well, Peg O'Connor, thank you so much. So we're going to talk about your book. Uh, title of it's Higher and Higher and Friendly Powers: Transforming Addiction and Suffering. Um, be- before we do that, um, who, who is Peg? Get a little background who is yourself. Peg? Uh, so I am I am Peg O'Connor. A uh, couple of crucial things to know about me. I am a philosophy professor for the last, I don't know, about 28 years. I do a lot with moral philosophy, but actually now do a lot more with addiction and philosophy because I think philosophy has a lot to offer people who are struggling with suffering and looking to make meaning and value in a world that seems remote or hostile or alien and that's been the bread and butter of philosophy for millennia. So I'm a philosopher and I'm also a recovering alcoholic. So those two things, philosophy and addiction go hand in hand for me. They, they hmm. have since I was a very young person. Hmm. How long have you been, I guess the term is how long have you been clean and sober? Uh, I've been in recovery for 35 years. So that's a, wow. that's a good long time. Wow. Yeah. I, I was, fortunate that I sobered up early just after I had graduated from college. I was, I was very Mm. lucky in that regard. My life could have taken some very different turns. My life may have been foreshortened by decades if I had continued doing what I was doing. Well, that's automatically strikes me as being probably not typical. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you have different, maybe I'm wrong there, but where you, you, I feel like folks get older and then they start putting a label of addiction onto something that's affecting mm-hmm. their tra- their marriage or their, 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 their parent, parenting or their job. You, you seem to have identified it pretty early. I identified it early. I, I started drinking when I was about 13 or 14, sort of right on the line there. Mm. And my drinking took oh, off. Wow it accelerated. And so by the time I was 15 or 16, I knew that I was drinking in ways that were very different from my friends. I knew that I couldn't stop Mm. once I got going. And I was having a lot of social ramifications from that. I almost got expelled from high school. Um, I went to Catholic school. Maybe that's another thing to know about me. I, I went to Catholic school and I was totally drunk at a school dance. And, uh, before I went into a blackout, I remember saying to the nun who was chaperoning, and your clothes are ugly too. And next, you know, Monday at school over the intercom was Margaret O'Connor to the Dean of Disciplines office. Um, And, you know, they threatened to expel me. They almost did, but, but they didn't. I was lucky. My dad knew the headmaster. They had been in Catholic school together as kids. So I I got a pass there, 
Um, but my, my parents didn't know what to do with me. So this was in the late seventies, early eighties. And thinking mm. about young people having addictions that just really wasn't in the scene. There, there wasn't a framework for that. And I think that's one of the good things that has happened is that we're a lot more aware of adolescent yeah. drug use and sort of the impacts on that and being far more proactive in our drug education programs rather than good old Nancy Reagan saying, just say no. Right, right. Not that that's very yeah. effective. So I, right. I knew early and I knew that I would um, try to stop and I'd stop for a while and then I'd pick right back up again. And by the time I got to college, I was an athlete in college. I wouldn't drink during season. So I'd say, well, I don't have a problem because I can stop drinking. And then, you know, like Mark yeah. Twain said, you know, quitting smoking is easy. I've done it thousands of times. <laughs> yeah. yeah is right. what it was like, what is what it was like for me. So, you know, by the time mm. I was just shy of 22, I had a terrible car accident and I was almost killed. I hadn't been drinking, but I would have been. And I realized at that point um, when I was offered all kinds of painkillers, because I was in a lot of pain, I thought, Betty Ford, here I come. I knew how I had taken to alcohol, you know, duck meat water. And I thought I would have the same thing with narcotics. So at that point, I decided to run an experiment, see how long I could go this time, because I had done it before and I had failed. So I see myself as still running that experiment. It makes me keep a very proactive relationship with my sobriety. And I got to be careful that I don't start taking it for granted or functioning on autopilot. And it's it's been good doing the kind of work on addiction that I do because it, it keeps it real for me. It becomes very easy. Yeah, it's always as we top get, of mind. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it gets easy if, if it seems like a little tiny speck in the rearview mirror. We forget the warning that, you know, objects are closer than they appear. But we think, <laughs> oh, that was just so, so long ago. I'm such a different person. Right. I am, but there are still certain strands that run through me. So I don't know. I, I always say to others, I don't know if I were to start drinking again, whether I would go back to that same very dangerous kind of drinking, but I choose not to find out. I, I choose why, not why, to why, test yeah. that hypothesis. Hmm. I'm just going to keep running right. in this direction. Right. Because a lot of folks, that when they do it when they get older, have a tough time adapting to social situations and, and all the triggers that happen in your day-to-day -day life when drinking was part of your life was a lot pretty right. easy. And then, you you know, so, so, so running that experiment it's just harder for folks, but it sounds like I'm mean, over the years, I mean, since you've been, you know, not drinking for so long, I'm sure you have little issue going out and be mingling with people drinking. I, I assume I, I shouldn't assume. But. Mostly, but, but sometimes I, I, I get really irritated or I, I still feel left out at certain times. So I remember hmm. um, with nine 11, you know, that was absolutely horrific. And a lot of my friends were grieving and having a hard time. And they all decided that, you know, they wanted to go out to the bar. And I thought, mm -mm, I, I can't go to the bar with them. I mean, I, it was hard feeling like this is how people process grief or anger or uncertainty. And I can't do it yeah. that way. And, yeah. you know, so there, there are still times and, you know, whether it's about me or, you know, part of my baggage, but I really don't be, I don't like being around people who are drinking a lot. I don't like being at activities where drinking is the center. So even mm. all these years later, you know, work parties where there's alcohol, I usually choose not to go or, you know, big holiday shindigs where, you know, there is so much focus on alcohol. It's just not, not what I want to do. So even now I still find myself needing to come up with strategies. I always say to people newly sober and sober a long time, always have an exit strategy. When you head into a gathering, take your yeah. own vehicle or be in charge of your own arrival and departure time, have mm -hmm. your right. reasons ready for why you're going to leave. And, you know, I'm so out about my recovery. I don't get this much anymore where, where people will start foisting drinks on me or, you right. know, get really a little aggressive with me, kind of poking me. Well, why don't you drink? Why don't you drink? Right, because right, right. I think in those settings where people maybe are a little worried about their own drinking, they see someone else not drinking and they project onto me the fact that, oh, am I watching them? Am I keeping track? And the answer is no. You know, you do you. I, I love my students taught me the expression, that's a you thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. I just choose not to put myself yeah. in situations like that. Yeah. Well, the reality is I, I, it, it, we do live in a, you know, an alcohol soaked society. I mean, oh. it's not, 
it it really i mean you one of your blogs i had caught it said something like uh, and i thought about this when it happened during the pandemic you know you know liquor stores were considered you know uh, essential businesses yes. and i think your blog was hey let's ask this question why are liquor stores considered essential businesses i mean it, and it just it makes you think they are in our society they are actually essential and, and sales were kind of sad sales were through the roof and we're mm-hmm. seeing the effects of that where the estimated number of preventable alcohol-related deaths has gone through the roof. It actually now outnumbers the the uh, number of deaths from overdose. I mean, so alcohol is this drug that people treat differently as a kind of drug. You know, and think about we say alcohol yeah. and drugs. No, alcohol is a drug, but I think we still like to have right, a right, distinction right. between well, there are the okay drugs, you know, alcohol. And marijuana has kind of worked its way into that category in right, a very right, kind right, of right, right. seismic shift in perception about alcohol. But then we like to have this idea, well, then there are the really bad drugs. There's meth, there's heroin, there's cocaine. And so it kind of gives these other drugs a bit of a pass because we think, oh, they're not as bad. They're not as dangerous. And, and that distinction is dangerous and not actually all that viable. It, it, yeah. Yeah, and it's 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 somewhat arbitrary. I, I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's you know, I would see maybe maybe there's extremes. You get to the meth and, and heroin. Okay, I can see that being less manageable for most people. But and it it's it the line is drawn based on politics and 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 agendas of the folks with the with the power. Mm-hmm. I mean, right? I mean, you could make that argument about so many things. I think they're doing more and more studies about psychedelics now that are just like they're not they're not that harmful. Um, now, a lot of folks don't all agree with that, but it used to be the thing like you're crazy if you ever touch that kind of stuff. And you could argue that alcohol is more damaging to the human body. Now, I don't know if that's data is completely consistent, but it seems to be it, changing it, a little bit. What are it's interesting? You know, I mean, alcohol withdrawal is the one yeah. kind of withdrawal you can die from. Let's be clear on that. You can actually so. die from. Yep. You yep. can die from it. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And okay. the thing about the psychedelic yep. drugs, I mean, up until the early 1970s, there was some good research being done on the role of psychedelic drugs in treating other kinds of mental health concerns, including addiction. Yeah. And then all of that, you know, with right, the war right. on drugs, all of that research just got shelved for the, about the last 35 years. And it's just coming back now where MDMA is showing some real promise, for example, in dealing with severe depression and with PTSD. So you're absolutely right that certain drugs get socially and politically coded, and then we do no research on them. And then it turns out, gosh, maybe these could be helpful if they're administered under the right kinds of circumstances. So the other thing that happens, though, is, you know, so here's all these clinical test trials being run, say, at Johns Hopkins and elsewhere. Then people think, oh, well, I can get some magic mushrooms from the local guy down the street or, you know, I can start licking frogs in a national park, whatever the heck that has been about, (laughs) and think we're going to have these great, wonderful kind of, you know, experiences where suddenly I'm not going to feel anxious anymore or my PTSD will be relieved. And and it is worrisome, but it's promising, too. So I'm I'm really excited about that work being done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the internet's helped. I mean, that we all can just consume information and, re- and get and get the data now, as opposed to just turning on the one of three news stations and hearing what the politicians are saying, right? You know, the whole remember the whole cracked egg. Your here's your brain on drugs. I mean, that scared oh, yeah. everyone or, or a lot of people anyway. But it wasn't. Yeah, no dare dare that. to it's keep like, your kids off drugs. I mean, you probably went through yeah, that. Yeah. I, that that was, yes, that was a my, little bit yeah. after me. So that's but that was your drug yep, yep. education. We see how effective that is as a. Yep, yep. Oh. But anyway, so 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 your book is you know you, you sent me the highlights and I appreciate that and it's it's it, there were just enough detail to really give me a, a picture of what it's um you know what the main themes are you're trying to touch on so I mean what what you've been in recovery for a long time like you just articulated obviously that fed a lot of the 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 the, the inspiration for the book I would imagine yes in an odd sort of way so here's here's what I mean by that um, I was someone hmm. who sobered up without AA and without professional treatment, which is actually what a lot of people do. So I'm not all that unusual. But I tried my first AA meeting as a 19-year-old in college. And I went to the meeting and I just pretty much ran out of the meeting as soon as it was over. Because I was nice and polite. I would never leave something in the middle of it before it was finished. But I was just, you know, agitated, ready to run. 
because the God language so alienated me. So having been raised Catholic with this very kind of Catholic, conservative Catholic notion of what a God is, I thought that I'm in serious trouble if my way to get sober is to turn my life and my will over to this God who's got a plan for me, who's going to remove my defects of character, who's going to set me on the path and my job is to stay out of the way, that that conception of God never worked for me. And so I never went back to an AA meeting until I had been about 19 years sober because I thought I need to do something different. I'm in a different phase of my life. Maybe I should try again. I had realized that I was, you know, running on autopilot, that certain things were starting to feel familiar in a way that I I didn't want to have happen again. And I found that I still had the same reluctance about that conception of God, but I also found that I liked many of the people. So I was curious about how could AA be more inviting to people who aren't believers in a very Christian notion of God, or at least a notion of God that's very providential. And so this book, Higher and Friendly Powers, in some way is is my my letter to my 19-year-old self to say, wait a minute, there's so much going on with that conception of higher powers. If we go back to the root source of it, which was in American philosopher William James's great work, The Varieties of Religious Experience. So my hope in this book is is twofold, or maybe I'm trying to aim it towards a, a, a very impossible audience, people who absolutely love AA and for whom it's worked, to learn more about William James, whom the founder of AA regarded as an important intellectual co-founder of that program. And people who struggle with AA, who feel like, I feel like a liar or a fraud because I don't believe in that God. I I don't believe that God has a will for me. And to maybe help people be able to accept different conceptions of higher power that might help them to reap some of the benefits of the program. Hmm. Now, is that the current I don't know much about the. De- I've, I've, I've actually had friends, you know, family members that have gone through the twelve step program and AA. Is it now? Most of them actually are Christian, so I, it would be less of a conflict, in, you know, in them, mm-hmm. in themselves, just just knowing who I, knowing the folks that I know and, and how the program works. Uh, is it is are those are the programs currently the same, or is it or have they moved towards more more of an agnostic, higher power concept that would be more amenable to what you're talking about? So it's a very interesting thing, Alcoholics Anonymous. There's no, there's a, there's a centralized office that deals with business things, but every AA meeting can Mm. have a distinct character from all others because Uh. AA is both a program of recovery. So there's the book Alcoholics Anonymous, there are the 12 steps that there is a program that goes with it, but it's also the fellowship, which is the people. So in any one particular, let's say you're in an urban area, you might go to an AA meeting that is very traditional and very much has that Christian-centric notion of God, even with the proviso in the 12 steps, God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us. And many of those prayers end with the Lord's Prayer, with with the Our Father, which is a very Christian prayer. Mm-hmm. Other meetings in the same city might have completely, I don't know what would be a nice way to put this, kind of remove the God language and instead said higher power and take out the right. pronouns to have a more inclusive and expansive sense. So part of the difficulty is, particularly with someone who's newly sober, they might not know what kind of meeting they're walking into And if they are Christian, they may feel very at home right away to hear that language. There's an all loving God who's going to take care of you. And if you're not Christian, if you come from a different faith tradition or you're an atheist or an agnostic, it can feel very alienating and sometimes even even hostile. So I know, for example, some of the meetings I went to were more straight up Christian and they would end it by saying, would all who care to join us in the Lord's prayer please do so. So I wouldn't. And people would regularly say to me, why aren't you joining us? Well, because you just said anybody who wants to go ahead and do it. Happy to have you do that. But I didn't want to say that prayer. Hmm. So, you know, for many people, AA is the only game in town. It's free. You can make a donation of a dollar if you want to help support your 
your local meeting, but it's widely available. And if more and more people are struggling with alcohol, you know, different kinds of drug usage, alcohol, or different kinds of behaviors like gambling, that may be the only option in town for them because treatment is inaccessible in so many ways for people, whether there just aren't any treatment centers, whether one's work situation doesn't allow it, whether one doesn't have insurance, I mean, all those sorts of things. So I guess my hope is just trying to make something that's widely available a little more perhaps open and inviting to others. Yeah. The little bit I read on it, it was, it was, it, it kind of, it, it basically alluded to, I mean, it, it, it alluded to what you just summarized where they, 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 it's almost like this, not, not franchise is not, not the right word, but the, each individual location can, can have a, they have a lot of freedom as to what they emphasize, what they de-emphasize. Are we whitewashing no. the concept of God? Is it a lowercase G? Is it an uppercase G? When they say he is look, you know, is a capital H, you know, so yeah, I, I could see that being, and, and whatever your belief system is, you know, an AA, unless it's a hardcore Christian program, then, then say it, right? Say it, get, or, or, but, but that's going to be a barrier to a lot of folks, like you said. So, but I feel mm-hmm. like they're, I feel like they're trying to toe a line and I might be completely wrong with this, but even when I see almost like it's an allegory to like our country, our presidents still, right. We're based on Judeo Christian principles. We, yes. we've kind of come away from that, right. We've come away from that, but our presidents still say the word God. And it's always, you know, you always hear them to under, you know, it's still obviously on our money. It's not, it's not. And, and I don't want to get into the discussion of whether that's the right thing or the wrong thing, but we are in this weird sort of dichotomy about when the president says, God, we're a country of all different belief systems. So which God is he talking about? Because, and I get into this discussion with folks a lot. They don't all, they don't even all allow the existence of the other. Like, so, so it's this weird kind of dichotomy where. Mm-hmm. It's like now maybe everyone can just hear it the way they want to hear it, and it speaks to them, and that's a that's a place of unity. But it it's always been a rough one for me to like. Are we saying we're Christian? We used to be Judeo Christian, right? And now the the world's gotten much different, and we've we're open the border. You know, we 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 want everyone here. If you're going to be a contributing member to society, that's that's our whole point. But then you, you, it gets weird. It gets really weird. It's almost, almost I just feel like it's almost an, an allegory to. to what you mentioned about AA, they don't know where to, and maybe it's okay. Maybe it's the balance we need. And maybe it's that tension is a healthy tension. I I, I don't know. I, just, I, I, I don't know. disagree that, that tensions can be healthy. And, and I mean, I think about the thing about the U S that is, is interesting is that the intellectual forefathers. So I don't mean Thomas Jefferson. I mean, the philosophers from whom Thomas Jefferson was drawing, for example, in the declaration of independence. So that was John Locke, you know, John Locke, British, uh, philosopher in the 1600s. And John Locke, in many ways, was a heretic. He didn't believe in the Blessed Trinity. And, you know, so so there you have this, this kind of, in some ways, Christian, but a heretic. But it's the intellectual foundation for Thomas Jefferson and for the Declaration and for our Constitution, where there was always a fundamental tension in there. And that I think the Founding Fathers couldn't get away from it because that was their intellectual framework, but they were wary about it. I mean, there, there's a reason why Thomas Jefferson had the expression, a wall between church and state, because he was worried about states, individual states at that time, imposing religions on geographic areas. And that's what he was trying to block. So it's just amazing. You're right. This is another subject, but the way it, it in is, which yeah, freedom yeah. of religion has been inverted, yeah. you know, it really was originally intended as, freedom from having religion foisted upon you by a state entity. Yeah. And I've, I, I, yeah. And history. honestly, and, and, and I've heard the, ex- I've, I've been in dialogues where it's the exact opposite where, no, 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 we should be a Christian nation. That's what the intent was. The intention was not to say, you know, it was, the intention was not to remove God. It was to, rem- you know, they don't want the church of England to be governing the States or, 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 the, or, 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 or the other way, basically. And it's like, I just interpret it as there is that tent that tension has always been there exactly like you just said. And I don't know if anyone can truly, you know, navigate that without getting a little bit. Well, I'm not quite sure what, you know, it's just, I I agree. Mm -hmm. It's just like sort of a healthy tension is the only way I can land on it. And I think that's, I don't know, people smarter than me will probably figure that out someday, but I don't know. Or they won't figure it out. And we'll just, yeah, we'll just keep hammering on each other. (laughs) 
It I seems know. to be the mo. These well, that's days. the thing I always go to. That is exactly right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming a broken record. We have these deep conversations, and sometimes they get like, uh, I don't know, just, just. It, I won't say violent. I never get violent. It's like loud and passionate. And I was like, if we just hugged each other after every conversation, no matter who you're having an argument with, I think the world would be a better place. But on the internet, you can't do that. So. It just ends in you can't do that vitriol most times. <laughs> well, and and I think what happens is we fail to see the humanity in the other. We fail to see the humanity of, of the person with whom we're arguing with because I reduce you to a position. Everything about you that may matter to right. who you, you are. are your you know, ideas. I just, yeah. I just, I'm going to reduce you. You know, you you crazy pro life or you crazy pro abortion. I mean, it's it's all reductionist. Yep. Yep. I, we've we've lost a lot of abilities to engage in critically productive kinds of dialogue because you can't reduce it to 140 characters you can't reduce it to a sound bite so i mean i think that's part of the the and it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of work work. to have conversations and really go against Mm -hmm. your your gut to see someone else's position and you know it, it it's hard and we don't have time a lot of people don't have time it's just going to work they they choose not to take time yeah that's true as well yeah Yeah. you know the thing is you know there's do I think the First Amendment freedom of speech is absolutely vital? Of course I do. But for me, every right has a flip side, which is a responsibility. So I'd like to talk more about our responsibility to listen and to listen yeah. charitably. We don't talk as much about that. And, you know, we get so busy focused on my rights, my rights, my rights, you know, individual rights. We forget mm. to think about, you know, to borrow an expression from a Native American philosopher, Daniel Wildcat. Instead of thinking about inalienable rights, what if we thought about inalienable responsibilities? We fundamentally mm. turn that worldview on its head. And, and I think, you know, if we were to think more about our relationships of responsibility that we have to particular others, so our families and close community members, and then continue to expand that, that, that gives us some really rich language to talk about mm so much of what is happening in the country that isn't going to be reduced to about a four shot exchange, you know, about my individual rights, yeah. my rights, my rights, my rights. It's like, eh, yeah. it's not productive yeah. anymore. So I'd mm. much rather talk about inalienable responsibilities. I like Far that. more interesting and productive. Yeah. So when, 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 when am I going to see Dr. O'Connor on the, uh, on the political ballot on stage? <laughs> <laughs> You know, that, that's, a, that's a fun, of all the things I would never, ever do, that would be right up the top of it is to run for the office. The worst job in history. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm with you there. And, and I'm so there. grateful the people who do it with the right spirit and who really I, I do it because yeah. they want to, to make change, even where I fundamentally disagree with them. If, if I can disagree with someone's principles I, I feel like I've got a chance to understand them and we can still connect. But if I can't understand yeah. the principles someone is operating under, or they aren't operating with under any moral principles, but except, except just kind of bare naked, ruthless ambition, I don't know what yep, to yep. do with them. Exactly. And unfortunately, the latter is what comprises as many of what, who we see on the stage today, unfortunately. I fear, ruthless I fear ambition. That. Yep. Yeah. Unfortunately. Um, so, so getting back to your book, so this concept of a higher power. So I don't know, do, how did you come to terms and how do you def- ended up settling on a definition of what, you know, to, to, to sort of leave that Christian centric God mm-hmm. definition and, and did, have you replaced that with something in, in, in that you think works? So the term higher power and higher and friendly power or powers comes from the American philosopher and psychologist, William James, in his book, his 1902 book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. So there's an intellectual story to be told here. So Bill Wilson was the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. So in 1934, he went to the Charles B. Towns Hospital in New York, and he's utterly defiant, he's broken, And he screams, you know, if there is a God, show yourself, I'll do anything to have this desire to drink be lifted from me. And the story goes, he felt this gust of wind and suddenly his desire to drink was lifted. So not long after he's worried, am I going crazy? Which would make sense because he's probably going through acute alcohol withdrawal, probably hallucinating from that. And they use belladonna at the time, which could also induce hallucination. So he's got a twofer going here. 
And a friend mm. gave him William James's Varieties of Religious Experience to understand what had happened to him as a kind of conversion. Now, here's the interesting thing. There's a, I would take it as a definitive treatment of the founding of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's called Writing the Big Book. Came out about two years ago. Uh, Schauberg is the author's name. And that story may be a bit of mythology on the part of Bill Wilson. Maybe it didn't really happen like that, but every program that's founded needs a good origin story that functions like a mythology. So in varieties that Bill Wilson did read, we, we know he read it at least once and maybe in another, another couple of times, many of the stories in there are people who undergo a similar kind of tsunami-like conversion for him, where suddenly something happens that is so big and grand that a fundamental experience, a change like that, must have been authored by something external to the person. It feels like a god just swooped in. So, you know, the paradigm cases, Saul riding to Damascus, and he gets knocked off the horse, and then he becomes Paul, and he becomes a Christian. And Bill Wilson said, that's kind of what happened to me with drinking. And so in James's Varieties, though, he talks about what Bill Wilson, you know, he describes the sort of experience that Bill Wilson has as a conversion. And what James says is that, you know, the only thing we know about a conversion is that it's a psychological process. It feels like it must be caused by something because it seems to come out of the blue. It's not like we consciously thought of it and then we change, but it's something just kind of flows through us. And he said, but the most we're licensed to say is it's a psychological conversion. And he goes on to say, you know, people who really do want to change, oftentimes they've been thinking about this. You know, in the back of my head, I had the the voice at first saying a whisper, you know, you've got a problem, you drink too much, you drink too much. And then the whisper shout, you know, you don't drink too much. And then the real shout in my head. And what what James says is that Thoughts and feelings can come unbidden from the subconscious and they burst through. And that's what a conversion is. And he goes on to say that people who are ready for a conversion oftentimes understand sort of how their present ways of living are wrong or incomplete or making them dreadfully unhappy. But they also have to have a, a, something that they his expression is they long to compass. You've got to have a positive ideal of some sort. You've got to have something that is just a little bigger and better to kind of grapple hook your way towards. And that's what he calls a higher and friendly power. And he says, anything can be a higher and friendly power. Anything larger will do. So some of the examples that James offers comes from Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was William James's intellectual godfather, talking about the transcendental ideals of truth and beauty, something bigger than you. He said moral decency, your moral principles, um, enthusiasm for humanity. He says the belief in an imminent divinity of, of nature, even a better version of yourself. All of those things, he says, are expansive. They help a person both reach out of their own little embattled selves to something bigger out there, or it helps them to reach inward to themselves to find something more expansive there that helps them to begin to reach out and expand rather than contract. And when you think about the ways that addiction makes many of us contract our lives so if things start to get in the way of our using, you know, if friends are always hassling us, like, ah, oh, you drink too much, we tend to drop those friends. Mm. Or it, we tend to drop activities, maybe, if they're going to interrupt our using. So our, our world, addiction, oftentimes, our world shrinks in a kind of way. You and more inward, recovery more and more is a kind of yeah. expansion or inflation of that world again. But it mm. happens from people changing drastically. And James is very clear, though, that there are just as many sudden, uh, there's just as many gradual conversions as there are the sudden ones. The sudden ones are big and flashing. They capture our attention. And much of, um, well, particular, you know, in Catholicism, the saints, you know, those people who undergo remarkable transformation and they suffer in all these kinds of ways. And, you know, their, their spiritual impulses burn so brightly. What James says is, Many people have profound experiences and changes in their life that have happened 
very slowly and gradually as a result of making small changes incrementally, but the result is just as big. And so I think that's really important for people struggling with addiction. So if you have read the book Alcoholics Anonymous called The Big Book, Bill Wilson talks about his own experience very early on. And I know many people early in sobriety might say, but I never had that big aha kind of tsunami moment. Maybe I'm really not an alcoholic or maybe I'm really not an addict. Maybe I don't really belong here. And Bill Wilson understood the way that his story functioned normatively or prescriptively. So he did later write a second appendix called um, Spiritual Experiences, I think it is, where he talked about those more gradual kinds of conversions, because that's what many people have who do change their relationship to alcohol and other drugs and other kinds of behaviors. So this book, Higher and Friendly Powers, is really also intended to offer more options about what a higher and friendly power can be. There are as many higher and friendly powers as there are individuals in the world. It's up for us to decide what can function in that way. And that that may change over time because we humans are always changing. And that's the really good news. That's a really exciting news. So what, what, you know, gosh, it's almost ubiquitous now. I feel like you just, we, we hear, I feel like, you know, the word addiction used to be, I don't know, maybe it's as I'm getting older. So my, my, my perspective or perceptions changed when I was from when I was a kid to now, but I feel like it's so ubiquitous now. Everyone seems to be battling something. I know what, with the, you know, the, the, what is it? The benzos and the, all, all these, the pharmaceutical mm-hmm. companies are certainly involved in making it so accessible to so many people. But, but then I just take a step back and say, well, okay, well that's just availability. But what, what is, you know, and it's, it's a simple question. It's a simple question, a hard answer, but what, what are we all trying to medicate away from? What, what are we losing? Like what, you know what I mean? There, there's, is, is it, I mean, you can go back down and down the list of causes of addiction. And I don't think, I think there's a lot of things we're learning, but there's no silver bullet there, but man, it seems like we're all just really in pain trying to dull something or get a, or, you know, escape reality. What's going on? I I think that's really interesting. So you're absolutely right that in part, this is a supply side creation. So what's really escaped notice is the way that the, rate of prescriptions for benzos is Mm. almost has increased almost as much as the rate of prescriptions for the opioids that's garnered all the attention. So we have more people now being prescribed benzos and the number of pills in Mm. each prescription has grown as well. And, you know, benzos are used a lot for anxiety and stress. So who's getting prescribed a lot of these? are middle-aged women, which is really Mm. interesting when you think about the kinds of stresses that many women are under. So, you know, I'm 57 years old and I have friends who are caring for their own very elderly parents and maybe their adult children are struggling and they're doing a lot of childcare for their grandchildren. So Mm. you have a lot of (laughs) late seventies, sixties, you know, I have friends who have, Parents, they're in their 70s and their parents are still alive. So the kinds of stresses where Mm. a lot of people aren't sleeping well, not eating well, money is tight, all these different kinds of stresses. And sort of one of the easiest ways to treat it is with a benzo. Well, let's just get some Ativan for you. You know, hopefully that'll work. Mm. And, you know, partly the issue is then you start mixing medication. So a lot of people who might be on an antidepressant are prescribed a benzo. And then if you add alcohol in that mix, it's just a nightmare. And so, yes, you're absolutely right. There's supply side creation, but the demand in some ways is growing because people are suffering and they are struggling in all different kinds of ways. And when it seems as if things really aren't going to get better, you know, whether financially or socially, for whatever kinds of reasons, it's hard not to become resigned to that in a kind of way, or even worse, fatalistic. Well, this is the kind of shit that just happens to people like me, or this is what happens, 
You know, right. if economically we have become so insecure, we don't know whether we'll be able to hold on to our house or we don't know whether our, our kids are ever going to be able to, to leave our own house. So I think the kinds yeah. of stresses and anxieties that are out there are through the roof. And so people are looking for various ways, not necessarily to escape them, maybe to some degree, but I think to try to live through the stresses. So, mm. Take the edge you know, off. unless yeah. and until we, we get some pretty significant changes, I mean, I think the pandemic combined with all the insecurity about inflation, for example, I mean, there's a reason why, you know, that expression, um, deaths of despair. I mean, this is an economic mm. issue very much as well, that there are certain swatches of the country who feel like we're getting left behind. We have no choice. Everything is being taken from us, you know, become resigned, become fatalistic. I mean, when you take a look at the increase, you know, death rates in certain populations, and that too has to go hand in hand with many communities of color feeling under the gun in all different kinds of ways. So you're starting to see certain drug usage tick back up there as well. And so it for me it's about it's about suffering and how do you transform that? How do you make meaning out of suffering? And so, you know, Nietzsche, you know, said that human beings suffer, that doesn't make us unique, but how do we make meaning from that suffering and how do we transform it? I mean, that's what human beings can do, but suffering that seems meaningless is the most torturous, he says. And I think a lot of people yeah. are feeling as if their lives are just an existence of suffering with no meaning. And that's that's absolutely horrifying and tragic. And, and some would, and I, I, yeah, I was going to ask you about the meaning thing, because I, I do, you know, there's a whole side of me that thinks it is a, 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 a sort of a denigration of or, or, or a weaning of the of the meaning we you know folks don't really feel like we have a meaning anymore um and i could sort you know i could i could make the argument that well the more that god is removed right or or you know then i can see that well what what are why are we here are we just a bunch of little atoms floating around for no purpose when things get hard it's like well i only got 30 more years and i'm gonna be dead so who cares right but going back to your point perhaps higher power could fill that void in a sense if you know maybe it's not quite religious but if if there's a, if there's coping mechanisms that you know that put some value on a higher power as they as they define it it could perhaps get them out of that that funk to some degree um i i, I, don't know. I think so so one of the um, bruce alexander who's done wonderful and johan hari done wonderful work on addiction and sort of what are the causes of it and neuroscience has taken a turn where we like to talk about now addicted brains or brains that have been hijacked by drugs mm. that, you know, muck up our dopamine reward system and, and all of that. And then Bruce Alexander and Johan Hari talk about the ways that you can't underestimate and you must include the kind of environmental considerations that go into people deciding to pick up alcohol or other drugs or start engaging in other behaviors that are readily available in a kind of way. And they talk about the kinds of radical dislocation and disconnection from others that it does when there's a lot of suffering happen. I think that a lot of people kind of revert back to either their own small selves, right? It's just me against the world, or I've got to take care of my family first. If I can't feed my family, if I can't make sure that they are okay, then I'm failing in a kind of way. And it becomes harder to pick your eyes up and look at a slightly broader horizon where how do we think about community well-being? Because where communities are thriving, there are social connections and those social connections are what contribute to the thriving. So I know, you know, sociologists and economists have been looking at the ways in which public goods are shrinking in a kind of way that keep people from engaging with others in myriad ways, making connections. And um, what was the book, Bowling Alone? So for example, that there used to be very rich social groups and happenings and activities around after work activities 
you know, there used to be bowling leagues. So I grew up in central Massachusetts where we had bowling alleys all over the place. And those bowling alleys had different leagues every night. And it was people out, it was families out gathering together. But many of that was through people's employment. So, you know, the Asher Pant may may sponsor a bowling team or a softball team. And when all those jobs disappeared, those kinds of leagues disappeared. And those, those ways of making connections with people that you might not otherwise. So, I mean, I think it, it is just absolutely so complicated but the move to make it be all about some of us have defective brains you know because alcohol or drugs have either screwed them up or we were already predisposed to develop an addiction i find those non-starters in conversation because you can say to me peg you were predisposed to develop an addiction and i might say that's not really the interesting question the interesting question though is why did I start using what activated that predisposition? Because you can have a predisposition that never gets activated, but what mm. activates in the kind of way? So, you know, all the money now is being put in brain research. And I think it's important to do it, but there's got to be a complementary track that looks at, I know they talk about the social determinants of health, which is a really dry mm-hmm. way of talking about it in the sense of why are some people just more vulnerable to really bad health. Well, maybe because they have no access or the choices they face aren't just a rock and a hard place, but it's a rock, a hard place, quicksand and a cesspool with a swamp off to the side. So, you know, unless and until we start talking about those factors, we're never going to be able to grapple with questions of addiction in ways that affect long-term significant change. We're still going to keep shoving it on to the person, new language, but still it's got something to do with the individual right. and not with the rest of the social, economic, political, moral world order. Yeah. I mean, if you, it's the age old question, heredity versus environment, right? Isn't that what we're saying? And I mean, it's, it seems like it's, it's probably both, but you can't, certainly cannot ignore it, the it's social. It's both and. Yeah. 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 But, but so for example, the U S government and the national institutes of mental, mental health have now prioritized funding that targets, you know, genetic markers, biomarkers in the brains for various kinds of mental disorders Hmm. at the expense of looking at what are other kind of interventions or behavioral techniques that we might use to stave off the development of mental illnesses or give people more ways to what deal with, live with, live through mental disorders that aren't requiring immediate pharmaceutical interventions. Mm. So we now put all the money towards, let's look at the genetics and then figure out how we can manipulate the chemistry rather than saying there are some time proven techniques that can help lessen and delay, say the, the onset of a psychotic episode in a young Mm. person, for example, who might be, you know, schizotypal who could go on to get full schizophrenia those kinds of programs aren't being funded anymore. Yeah. Well, so I, I, I pretty it's a significant sure that loss. The, the lobby of big pharma, pharma is certainly going to be pushing that one side you spoke about, not the other, right? If we could find... And that side's genet- winning. Oh, yeah. 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 It, it's amazing how, how much you... I mean, you always follow the money with most things, right? But it's amazing what big yeah. pharma has. You know, I hear that term. Sometimes these people roll their eyes. Oh, you always hear that. But if you really dig into a lot of our problems... Man, big farmers behind a lot of it, in my opinion. If you really, because now, if in your example, if you can find that genetic marker, that's the problem. <clears throat> now I can find a pill that'll that'll find you know that'll solve that or, or override that genetic deficiency, or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. It's it's a lot, lot. It's not. It's a lot more sexy than the other approach that you or, that you articulated, which is more of a slow, healthy. Let's 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 have healthy responses to our stimulus. Let's understand some of the childhood trauma I went through. Let's talk about like whatever it might be. The other side is right? much much more sexy and much more lucrative, right? I mean, well, and 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 allegedly faster, mm. right? It's it's much easier to take a pill than it is yeah, to well, yeah. you know, let's be in therapy and learn some behavior modification right. <laughs> techniques. Let's learn right. some self soothing techniques. So when you start to feel yourself ramp up, here are some things you can do, right. and. And it's so hard. I mean, I am not a parent, but I've certainly talked to enough parents 
of my own students and, and friends who are parents, who if they have a child who is struggling in different kinds of ways, where you know one of the first stops is to their physician, to their pediatrician, and begin to wonder, you know, does my child have anxiety disorder or does my child have ADHD? Because parents want for their children to do well and they want to figure out the best ways of doing it. And I think we live right. in a culture now where medical authority has been so elevated that uh, it becomes kind of much easier to get into the yeah. medicalized tracks of diagnosis, even in elementary mm -hmm. school. And, and I think that so many parents struggle. They want to do right and well by their children. And right. if their doctors are saying, you know, this is the thing to do, Right. I say this to you as a parent, right? I mean, what, sure. what do you do? You want to do right by your child. Sure. And sometimes it's treated as it's, it's a disjunction. You're either going to go this way or that way. It can't be a both and. And mm. that's my worry. We've always got a disjunction going rather than this should be a both and at the same time. And, and say many of the drugs that were originally reduced as antidepressants were meant to be part of a both and. Yeah. Take these right. drugs to kind of give you a chemical boost to, you know, stabilize or, or reach a certain level where then you'd be able to do the work in therapy, where then you'd be able to right, do right, right, the, right. the kinds of, you know, training and different kinds of behavior modification where yep. this may not be a forever drug, but we're giving young children forever drugs with, you know, with writing prescriptions off label because they weren't tested in kids. So mm -hmm. that, that's, that's worrisome in all kinds of ways. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of profit. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot, a lot and follow, follow the money. Follow You're the right. money. Yeah. You just, you can't, yeah. Yeah. And it, it's hard. Like I said, parents, I mean, you have, you, 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 are told that you, you, you trust, you, have, you want to be able to trust your medical professional uh, professionals. Yes. You know, I, 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 I'm always a trust, but verify guy. But even in that case, I don't have that much time to go doing all my own research. Oh, maybe this might work or maybe that might work. It's like, paying all this money for insurance, our medical professional saying, here, you, this is the best thing for now, take the pill. Okay. And it's the best for our child. Okay. Well, I got to move on with things and just hope that's the best. You know, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Hard is the only word I can think of. Um, it's crazy. Yes. But it is. I, it is. <laughs> now, what they want to ask you, and this gets a little personal, but you started drinking at 12 or 13. And if it's too personal, just say the next, next topic. 13 or so. Yeah. What the heck? What, uh, little insight what was going on back then or were you just or do you not or was i mean mom dad but... um i i grew up in a great home loving parents and and all of that but i started mm. to get the sense that i liked girls and so there i am in a catholic uh. context thinking wait a minute i'm different from my friends in these kinds of ways and i felt so mm. socially awkward and i always felt like am i somehow going to be found out can everyone just you know read what must be written across my face that, you know, I might be, and I'll use the language of the time. I might be queer. I might be a dyke. I mean, and those were all meant as pejoratives. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I, I drank to try to fit in, you know, to maybe shake off some of my, my nervousness, but mm -hmm. I would always kind of drink right past that. So sort of the, the shame about maybe my sexual orientation became compounded by the shame that I had about drinking differently from my friends. So it just became this big mm. kind of snowballing shame. And that just continued to, to drive my use in all kinds of ways. Then I became ashamed that I wasn't doing as well in school as I probably should have. I became ashamed that I was waste, wasting my educational opportunity. I mean, I think shame is one of those things. It's, it's very opportunistic and, and, you know, I could get my shame to attach to anything. Yeah. Um, you know, I was, I was also a competitive tennis player. And so I'd be ashamed if I missed a ball. Every, every shot was a referendum on my moral worth. Every shot, every point, every game, every set, mm. every match. And it just became, I was beating up myself for absolutely everything. And alcohol aided and abetted that. Full mm. stop. That's as simple as it gets. So you think, I mean, that's, that was the smoking gun. You weren't going to fit in. You didn't like boys, so you feel like that set you down a. Now it it, it is it that, is it is that, you know, it, yeah yeah. I mean it, it is sad when you you know 
I, I was just having this conversation with friends over the weekend, or this during this week actually, and it's like it, it, the damage, the, you know, a society's acceptance or lack thereof of a person, the damage, the the, the long standing damage that can do, right? It's just it's sad. I feel I feel for folks like you know, I, it's like it, it it it's it's crazy, you know, just that that we, ability we internalize not to. It. Yeah, because you you just don't feel like we internalize it. So then, yeah, so then we can Mm. be judge, jury, and executioner twenty four seven. We are Mm. never outside the gaze of that judgment because we've internalized it always. Yeah, and that's the vicious thing about internalizing, you know, oppressive stereotypes or oppressive beliefs about people like you, and then you can fill in, you know, what that like you is. Whether you're yeah. a woman, whether you're gay or lesbian, whether you yeah. are fully able-bodied or disabled—I mean, all these sorts of right. things—and we get really good at completely painting ourselves with a very, with a very broad brush. We do, we do. Man, we're sometimes I'm like, as humans, we're awesome. Other days, I'm like, man, we suck as humans. <laughs> you know, I just don't. You know, we just. But, but yeah. we can't end. We can't end on that note. We suck. No, no, no. That's a good point. <laughs> that's good point. No, 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 we're not going to end there because you know, I think one of the things that that I, that I love about William James is he talks about the ways that not that we have a self. There's no kind of static, authentic, standing self that we always are. He talks about the way we're always selving. We're always in process. We're always changing. Yeah. We're changing as our material bodies change. We're changing as our clothes change. We're changing as our social commitments change. We change as our intellectual interests change. And that human beings are capable of remarkable transformation. And his language is wonderful. He says, you know, we can be rejuvenated. We can be regenerated. We can be transformed. We can be reborn. We can become people whose lives now are oriented around gratitude rather than grievance. Hmm. You know, we become people who are living and willing to live on possibilities and maybes and that we can have, we can have faith and faith is just simply a, a willingness to live on a maybe or a possibility where the results aren't certified in advance. Yeah. We can have faith that we can be hmm. different and better people. We can have faith that we can maybe make better lives for our kids and our having that faith is what helps to bring about the fact that we do that. And so that relationship between faith and fact and sort of what we are able to do when we're willing to do it, not just when we wish to do things, but when mm. we're willing to do things is utterly remarkable. And so at the end of the day, I, I am an optimist by nature. I am someone who wants to live in gratitude and keep grievances away from me as far as I can get them. And I know that sometimes I, like anyone else, can get in my, you know, whiny, why me kind of feeling aggrieved about everything. But then that's also an opportunity for me to kind of check myself to say, what's going on that suddenly you think everything is about you? And the fact that, you know, the universe is conspiring against you because you've hit three red, right, three red, lights in a row. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. So, you know, to see opportunities, there there are opportunities and struggles and many struggles are unwanted. My addiction was an unwanted opportunity, but now I wouldn't change it. And not just because I'm grateful to be sober. I'm, I'm grateful for this condition, a limiting condition that I live with. I wouldn't change it. Unwant, unwanted opportunity. That's, that's a fantastic unwanted two, opportunity. Two, two word. Life is full of that. them. Yeah, so I love take that. Them. That's a that's that's a great way to look at it. Well, Peg, this was that was. Th- thank you for pulling us out of the negative uh, pit that I pulled us into for a second there. But um, that's a great way to. That's no, a great I way dove to end into it. that pit. Very appreciate. I dove into yeah, it no, no, with we, you, but, I, we're, yeah. but we're out of it. <laughs> we are. We are. We're and, out of it. And, and I I appreciate that perspective getting us out of it. Um, so the book, Higher and Friendly Powers, uh, Transforming Addiction and Suffering. It, it's, it's, I'm going to pick it up. It's fantastic. It, I love the summer you sent me, so I, I'm sure the book is amazing. Uh, it's out. It was out, what, last summer? This summer? It came out 22? in late August. Yep. Late August. Okay. All right, Pe- uh, Peg, thank you so much. Um, I'll be in touch when this goes thank live. Thank you, Vinny. And, um, yeah, this was great. I really, re- really enjoyed the conversation. I did uh, too. I enjoy, so. I enjoy your, your story, personal story and your, your work story. So.